Uh, whenever we join something, and that could be pretty much anything, whenever you join something, we need to know what is expected of us and what is going to be provided for us. Now, that's true, uh, whether you're talking about a, joining a new company, uh, whatever the job might be, if you get a new job, new paid employment, then you need to know what's expected of you. You need to know what your job description is. You need to know what hours are demanded uh, from you. And you also know what is going to be provided for you. Ultimately, most of us at that point think about our wages, don't we? But there'll be other things. What is going to be provided for us and what is expected of us? But it's not just a new company. If you join a new sports team, uh, whatever that sport might be, whether it's football, rugby, or chess. Uh, someone once said to me that chess is really a sport. Some of you are frowning at me, but no, it's got serious stress involved. Lots of sweating happens uh, when you play chess. Uh, whatever the sport is, you need to know what's expected of you. Do you need to go to training sessions? How often do you need to go to the matches? What kind of time? You've got to know what's going to be provided for you uh, by the team. We could go on, uh, whether you are uh, uh, renting a new house, uh, whether you have a new mortgage agreement, you've got to know what kind of things are expected, how much is it going to cost, what is provided for you in return. The list goes on and on and on. And the principle is simple. Whenever you join something, we've got to know uh, what's expected and what will be provided for us. Now, the same is true, absolutely true, with Christianity. Uh, Christianity is not let me emphasize that, is not fundamentally about rules. It is not fundamentally about rituals. Uh, fundamentally, Christianity is about a real personal relationship with Jesus Christ. With Jesus, who is our Savior and who is our Lord. And to become a Christian, and there are different ways of putting it, in many ways we could say is to join his team. Or we can talk about joining his gospel enterprise. Or to use biblical language, it is to join his kingdom. So when you become a Christian, you are joining something. And therefore, we need to know what is expected of us and what will Jesus provide for us. And the question is, how do we know? And there's a very simple answer to that question. We discover what's expected of us and what is provided for us when we listen to what God says in the Bible. Uh, that is God's book, and it's where he lovingly, clearly, unmistakably reveals what we need to know, everything we need to know about how we live our lives for him. It is not mystical. It is wonderfully, beautifully, brilliantly clear. And of course, that's what we want. Now, at this point, we face great danger because many of us may actually have the wrong expectations. Uh, perhaps in the past, we have never really been taught or maybe in the past we have been incorrectly taught or maybe we have been properly taught, but we never listen. And so therefore, what we have to ensure we, uh, we reach at this point in our lives is to make sure that our expectations are in sync uh, with the Bible. You know how it works in terms of you talk to musicians and um, that you have your instruments, but musicians are always having to retune. There's a certain standard, uh, but instruments go out of tune and you have to retune. And um, some of the engineers amongst us will know about recalibrating instruments. When your instruments get out of sync and you have to recalibrate, we as Christians have to make sure that our expectations of what is expected of us and what is provided for us sometimes can get out of sync with what God says in the Bible. And therefore we have to recalibrate, we have to retune. And that is what we are going to be doing in this new teaching series on John chapter 13 to 17. And let me say, it is a brilliant section for doing this to get the right view of what a normal Christian life actually looks like and feels like. And let me tell you why. Why is this a great bit of the Bible to do it? Because this is exactly why it was written. Its purpose in God's plan is to teach us what is expected of Christians and what is provided for us. Uh, look at verse uh, 1. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. 
Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Uh, We're told here that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who was born and who had lived and who had ministered, and we're talking here about 33 years of his life. At this point in his life, we're told that there is a turning point. He is now returning to his father. And we're told here that his hour had come. Now, you may know this already. If you don't, I'm going to tell you, and then you will know it. In John's gospel, this little phrase, the hour, is really significant. You read the beginning of John's gospel, and you'll hear again and again, my hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. It is not yet come. Just read the gospel. You see it again and again. And then you get to a point in John chapter 12 when it says, my hour has come. My hour has come. And you think, what, what is he talking about? And the hour in John's gospel refers to his death on the cross. Everything is leading up to this climactic event, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So in John chapter 13, we are told that the hour has come. And that means this. Jesus Christ is returning to his father, but how will he get there? He will get there via the cross. That's so significant if you're going to understand this bit of John's gospel. Yes, he is returning to the father, but he gets there via the cross. Now, what motivates him to do it? It's wonderful to read verse 1, isn't it? Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Everything that Jesus Christ has done thus far has been motivated by love. Everything has been motivated by love. And at this point, as he heads to the cross, he doesn't forget love. It is love that takes him there. It is love that takes him to the cross, through the cross, and therefore he returns to his Father in heaven. And therefore, in the light of all of this, what does Jesus do? He prepares his disciples for what life will be like when he is reigning from his throne in heaven. I almost said he prepares his disciples for what life will be like when he's not there. But that's not actually true. He is returning to his father in heaven, but he's not going to leave them on their own. He's returning to his father in heaven, and he's going to rule and reign from his throne in heaven. But as we will discover, he will send his Holy Spirit to be with them. Let me tell you, his disciples are not left on their own. So this is a description of what the normal Christian life looks and feels like when Jesus Christ is reigning from his throne in heaven. Now the focus of these first few verses in John chapter 13 is on the dramatic foot washing that Jesus performed for his disciples during what Christians call the last Supper. And in a moment, we're going to dive in. I'm going to take you through some of the details. But before we dive in, I just want to highlight one critical, crucial verse that you need to know if you've got to understand what's in front of you. Look at verse 7. Jesus is speaking to Peter, and Jesus says to Peter, as he does this, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. That's critical for his to get. Jesus says to Peter, as he conducts this foot washing on Peter and the others, that Peter and the others won't really understand the significance of what Jesus is doing until later. There is an event that is coming later that will explain what he is doing. And what's the event? We know, don't we? He's going to the cross. He's going to die on the cross. That is the later. That is the hour that is coming. And therefore, what he is saying to Peter is, when I have died on the cross, you will understand the significance of what I'm doing now. That is, the cross of Jesus Christ explains the foot washing. Or if I can put it like this, the foot washing is all about the cross. Now, you've got to know that. Now, in light of that, there are two comforting and challenging truths that I want to mention today. First is that Jesus' death on the cross results in complete cleansing. And Jesus' death on the cross results in radical service. So let's do them in turn first. Jesus' death on the cross results in complete cleansing. Verses 2 to 11. So look at verse 3. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power 
and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So, notice the connection. So, he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. Here is a question that we've got to ask. Why are we told, why are we told that Jesus knew that the Father had put everything under his power and that he was returning to the Father? Why are we told that? before we are told what Jesus did that evening. Why not just say, Jesus got up, got a towel, got the basin, and then washed his disciples' feet? Why, before we get told what he did, are we told something significant about what Jesus knew about his identity? Well, the reason is to emphasize just how radical an act of service this is. Uh, Foot washing in the first century was reserved for those the society considered the lowest. It doesn't take a genius to work out why. Uh, In first century Jewish world, uh, people walked around with open sandals. The roads were dusty. Uh, The roads were not just dusty, the roads were dirty. Think about all the animals uh, that walked around the roads and everything that the animals left behind them. So, And if you arrived at dinner, uh, someone would have to wash your feet. And it would be left to the slaves to wash the feet of the travelers. Because the task was not pleasant, was it? You think it is hard to get people to wash their hands or your kids to wash their hands in the sink with a nice little push-down soap? (laughs) Think about washing their feet in first century Jewish world. Do you see why we're told what Jesus knew about his own identity? It is a reminder of just how big, how grand an act of sacrificial service this was. Jesus is the greatest and the most significant king in the universe. He knows who he is. He knows he has come from the Father. He knows he is returning to the Father. He knows that the Father has put everything under his feet. He is the grandest, the most glorious king. And it was this king who picked up the towel and the basin to serve his disciples. If anything, it should have been the other way around. The disciples serving their master. But in the case of Jesus, it is a radical turning of the tables. The one who deserves to be served becomes the one who lowers himself to serve those least deserving. Isn't that amazing? Now, we discovered in verse 8 that that is something that one of the disciples just cannot handle. (laughs) Listen to Simon Peter. If you're not used to the Bible, let me tell you, Simon Peter in the Bible is the big mouth. You know, he doesn't engage his brain before he speaks. He engages his mouth and then he thinks if he's got a brain. That's the kind of thing about Simon Peter. But you can relate to the the honesty of this. Verse 8, Peter, no, Peter says... (laughs) You shall never wash my feet. And Jesus responds, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. You see, Peter does have an appreciation of who Jesus is. He does know who he is, and he knows just how lowly a task This is to wash the feet. And as a result, he cannot comprehend, he cannot believe that it could possibly be right for Jesus, the king of the universe, to do this. And Jesus' response is crystal clear. Unless I serve you, Peter, unless you allow me to serve you, you have no part in me. What does he mean? Well, remember, this is all about the cross. Okay, This is all about the cross. What Jesus is about to go and do, he's about to go and die on the cross and his blood, his shed blood on the cross is going to cleanse people from their sin. That's the connection between the water and the blood of Christ. The water is all symbolic of the way the blood of Jesus would clean up people from their spiritual dirt. And Jesus is saying that unless Peter allows Jesus to serve him, by dying on the cross to provide for his spiritual cleansing, then Peter can have no part in Jesus at all. There's no place in the kingdom if you don't allow Jesus to serve you. 
That's how important the death of Jesus is. It is the only way to be saved from sin. Now, there are still some like Peter today who, who either cannot believe that God would do this, should do this, or even could do this kind of thing. Uh, there are some religions out there, Islam is one of them, that one of the reasons that they cannot comprehend that Jesus could possibly be God is because he dies on a cross and gods don't do that. But the God of the Bible lowers himself to serve us because he loves us. Now, I agree, friends. I agree. This is not normally the way things happen. You think about VIPs all around the world. You think of how our queen and prime ministers and leaders of nations get treated when, when they travel around. They have an entourage, don't they? And they have people around them who, who cater for them, who serve them. Think about, I was just looking at the, uh, the North Korean president. King Kim Jong-in. Do you know what happens when he travels around in his big car? Have you ever seen this? And his bodyguards? They're all running around. <laughs> they're all running. We all think it's a bit daft, don't we? You don't get, you don't get President Trump with all his like special agents running around, but, but he does it for a reason. So there he is and he's the important guy. He's the important person and all his secret service bodyguards are all running uh, to keep up with a car. You can't imagine. Uh, the Korean president saying, guys, why don't you get in the car and I'll run beside it? He probably couldn't run five paces, actually. But we know that's not the way the world normally works. The higher you are, you've got more and more servants to look after you. But King Jesus is wonderfully different. Wonderfully different. He came to die on a cross to provide cleansing for our sin. We have a master who serves his followers. Now the question becomes, how effective is the cleansing of Jesus? And the answer is found in verses 9 to 11. Listen to this, verse 9. And Peter is great, isn't it? Because he he goes from one extreme to the other, doesn't he? He goes from never to verse 9. Then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. And you are clean. Though not every one of you, he knew who was going to betray him. Uh, Peter shifts from not wanting Jesus to do um, anything to wanting Jesus to do everything. And that allows Jesus to make an extra point. Previously, and you get this, his point previously was simply to say that Jesus' death on the cross is a humble, purposeful way of cleaning up sinful people and making them presentable to God. That's what it has been to this point. That's what Jesus' death on the cross would be. That's what the foot washing symbolized. But now, after Peter's question or statement, Jesus now stresses that his cleansing sacrifice for sins is completely effective. Peter says, I need you to clean me all over. And what does Jesus say? It's fascinating. He says to him, Peter, you are clean. That's what he says. Already, Peter, you are clean. Already. What? How? Well, remember, Peter has already trusted in Jesus. He's already put his faith in Jesus Christ. And according to the Bible, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are completely clean from that point. It's called being born again. It's when the Spirit of God comes into your heart and applies the blood of Christ. That had already happened to Peter, even though Christ hadn't even died yet. But the cleansing work of Jesus Christ on the cross had already been applied to Peter at the point of his faith when he was born again and therefore Peter was clean. So what's all this about needing to wash his feet? Well now the point Jesus makes is this. He's referring to the ongoing sins of a believer. Now we're still as Uh, believers in Jesus, we are clean and we are safe. When we have faith in Christ, that is our new status. But we still sin, don't we? You know it, I know it. We've confessed our sins already. And now Jesus says, he's talking about that fresh application of the blood of Christ for our guilty consciences. That's what he means. Peter, you're clean. You've had your bath. The bath you have as a Christian is when you are born again by the Spirit. 
The washing feet now becomes an application of that ongoing application of the blood of Christ for our guilty consciences. That is, we continue to say sorry to God, both personally and corporately, not because we are somehow all over dirty. The blood of Christ once and for all makes you clean. But we need that continued application of the blood of Christ for our guilty consciences. And the metaphor, that's about washing your feet. 1 John, the author of John's Gospel, writes it in 1 John in his letter. If we claim to be without sin, he's writing to Christians. We deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he will purify us. He will forgive us our sins. It's not that Christ has to die again. Christ has died, his blood is effective, but it is the Spirit applying the blood of Christ freshly to our consciences. Sometimes I meet Christians and they just don't believe we should be doing this. This idea that we should continue to confess our sins. Why not? Brothers and sisters, you and me will sin. We are clean and covered, but we need the fresh application of the blood of Jesus Christ uh, in our daily experience. But what this tells us when you get all these verses together is that Jesus' death provides complete cleansing, everything we need. So let me say this to you in terms of application. Are you someone today who has not yet put your faith in Jesus Christ? Then you have to let him serve you. Do not buy into this nonsense in the world that says, I am not a sinner, I am a good person that doesn't need a saviour. You do. You need Jesus' blood to be applied to you. You need to be born again. You need to be clean. But when you put your faith in Jesus, he cleans you up completely. Now, do you need to do that? You've been learning and listening. Have you got to the point when you say, yes, Jesus, serve me, clean me? Let me encourage you if you're a Christian. And maybe you're struggling to to work out the ongoing sin with your past faith in Christ. Let me say this to you very clearly. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are like Peter. You are clean. Full stop. Nothing can move you from that position. So be assured. Be happy. When you trust in Christ, you're secure. But let's keep on applying the blood of Christ to our recent sins. It is why we do that personally. It is why we have a corporate confession every single week. Not only do we say to anybody who comes to us, we are not a bunch of hypocrites, we are sinners who need a saviour. But it is applying the blood of Christ to our consciences. What do we say? When you join anything, you need to know what's expected of us. You need to know what Jesus provides for us. Well, there's something of what Jesus provides for us. or what is expected of us? Second point, Jesus' death not only provides and results in complete cleansing, it results in radical service. Jesus' death is also an example. It is an example, not first. (laughs) The first port of call is to know that Jesus' death is a unique saving act done for us. That's, That's the first point, okay? You've got to go there first. But after you understand that Jesus' death is a unique saving act done for us, then you can move on to Jesus' death as an example. It is devastating if you miss point one and go to point two. But point two is this. Verse 11, verse 12. Listen to Jesus. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you, he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, that is what I am. Now that I have, uh, Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. And you cannot miss it, can you? Verse 15, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. You cannot miss it. It is now an Example. Now, the point is not that we all go about and literally wash the feet of other Christians. Now, you may want to do that. I'm not opposed to doing that. Uh, but that is not the point of this text. The point is that we have the same attitude as Jesus when it comes to serving our brothers and sisters. And that is much more radical and much more costly. If I can put it like this, 
Our lives, if you're a Christian, are to be defined by purposeful, costly, servant-hearted love. Purposeful, costly, servant-hearted love. Here's a question for you to think about. I've been chatting about this with different people over the last few weeks and months and years. How much of your life does Jesus want? Uh, There comes a point uh, when other people begin to worry about the impact that Jesus might be having on a family member or a friend. And maybe you've experienced this too. Uh, When it all seems to be getting a bit too serious. And it seems to be okay to a point, maybe when it's seen as a, a hobby. But surely the brakes need to be put on to anything that's a bit more serious than that. You know when it begins to impact your time or your money uh, or your commitments, surely that's a bit wrong. So let's ask the question, how much of our lives does Jesus want? And do you know the answer, the short version? He wants all of your life. He wants all of it. Every single part of it. Now please don't misunderstand this. This does not mean that he wants us to stop doing all the things we currently do and to retreat into a religious monastery. I've said this before. I am not asking you to move in with me in my house and to form a monastery. Okay, I just want to, just in case you still think that. I love you very much, but that is not the commandment of the Bible. Also, when we talk about Jesus having every single part of your life, It doesn't mean that he now simply wants you to do church activities all week. Jesus Christ as Lord of your life, he wants to enhance your leisure. He wants to make it better, actually. Uh, He wants to enhance your work, whether that is paid work or not paid work. He wants to help us to become better friends. Uh, better family members, better neighbors. He wants to help us become better moms and dads and husbands and wives. He wants all of that. But he also wants us to show committed, sacrificial love for our brothers and sisters in the church family. And let me say this to you. Jesus expects that of all his followers. Jesus doesn't say, I'm going to give an example if you're super keen. Or maybe if you're part of the inner core, whatever that might be. No, Jesus Christ in John chapter 13 says, I have an example for all my followers. If you are on my team, this is what is expected of you. To love your teammates in practical ways. Now I want to give you some examples of what that could look like in just a minute. But first let me emphasize this. Actions flow from attitude. You get that? Anything we do, our actions flow from our attitude. And if you don't get the attitude right, actions don't flow. You've got to work on the inner heart, our attitude. And therefore, what I want us to pray is to help our attitude and our inner internal motivations is let's all pray that as we look afresh at what Christ has done for us, let's pray that the Spirit of God would embed in our hearts that example of Christ And therefore, in our minds, we will feel his commands. So as you gaze at Christ and what he has done on the cross for us, we want to be praying that Spirit of God, take that and allow me to feel that. So that whatever I think about serving my brothers and sisters, I think to myself, Christ has done this for me. He's done it for me. The Lord of heaven has come down and served me. Wow. See how that will just change in terms of as you think about what I might want to do for others. What does it look like in practice to to love your spiritual family? My experience is, is rather than trying to think of one huge sacrificial act, I think this is sometimes the danger that preachers have at this point. They come up with some you know, really dramatic illustration of someone who's done something that is so outrageously big and everybody in the church family goes, wow, isn't that great? And our emotional heartstrings are pulled and then we don't do anything about it because we could never do that. Uh, my experience has been that rather than trying to think of one huge sacrificial act, maybe like leaving a church family, a huge substantial legacy in your will, or maybe retiring deliberately to to move 
to help a small church grow or some big sacrificial act of love, often what happens is our actions are determined by a hundred little decisions every week. So not so much the big one, but every week there are a hundred little decisions that we take that either can be directed in love for others or love for self. And normally, the big sacrificial decisions only get made by the people who make the hundreds of little ones. So what might it look like? What examples of those little decisions that that make our love for our brothers and sisters purposeful, costly, servant-hearted? Think about this. Could you visit people who are more isolated in our church family? How you might hear about them. How you may hear their names and uh, hear them prayed for. Um, it is one thing, isn't it, to ask after them. It is one thing to call them up, which is wonderful. Uh, but what about thinking of going to see them? And having a cup of tea and a chat. What an attitude of love. And, and what if we develop that attitude so that, yes, we could do it when someone asked us, but what if we, uh, we just did it? Because we loved and we wanted to do it. Um, what about picking people up to bring them to church? And not everybody has a car, not everybody can easily get this. And by the way, as I say this, I know that people are doing this already, and I rejoice in this. But this is to give you some examples of how we can keep on doing it even more. There are people that rely on getting to church by people picking them up. And sometimes we've got this phrase, and, and people are trying to minimize the discomfort of others. So sometimes people might say, well, I'm very happy for you to come and pick me up as long as it's not out of your way. You ever had that? Not, not out of your way. Think about how we can be motivated by the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you think it was out of Christ's way to come and die on a cross? I think it was, wasn't it? He left the security of heaven to come and die on a cross. Look, I can drive five miles out of my way to pick up a brother and sister from, to get them to church. Can you not? If you can see Christ coming down from heaven to die for you. You see how the, the example of Christ can motivate us? Uh, what about this? Uh, what about getting to church early? What about just getting here at quarter past ten so that you can mingle around, talk and listen and chat and befriend? If that can be motivated by love, can't it? What about, and I know I'm getting to radical decisions now, so please don't throw anything at me. What about even sitting in a different place? <laughs> I know, I know. You want to get up and walk out now, I know. Look, I haven't asked you to sit at the front, okay? That's even more radical. But do you see how actually sitting in a different place can be actually a sign of love? To actually walk into a building and to scan the room and to think, actually, you know, I want to purposely chat to that person. I want to find out about their story. It's going to be easier for you to chat to that person if you're not sitting seven rows behind them, but actually next to them. These are all the hundred little decisions that are motivated by love. Maybe staying behind uh, to talk. Maybe not instantly talking to our best friends um, after the service. Maybe purposely loving someone you don't really know. Maybe it's joining one of our Sunday ministry teams. And you think, well, wait a minute. If I join one of the teams, maybe I'm quite happy to maybe just say, just ask me as and when. But if I had to join maybe one of the, the rotors, will that involve... Uh, commitment? Yep. <laughs> uh, do you think it took some commitment from the Lord Jesus Christ to leave the security of heaven to go and die on a cross for us? Yep. <laughs> yeah. But I look to Christ and I think, if he did that for me, if he did it for me, what would I not do for him? Uh, and when you are part of a team, what about things like this? Why well, be reliable? Swap when necessary. Uh, turn, turn up on time. Do what's expected. You might say, turn up on time. That's a sign of love, isn't it? You love our brothers and sisters in this moment. And more about this. Could we even start increasingly to plan our other commitments around our commitments to Jesus Christ and the church family rather than the other way around? <laughs> wow. Now, I know. I know we are completely conflicting with our culture at this point. Our culture wants us to do life with as little commitment as possible. 
That's just what happens, isn't it? Whether it's in relationship or even gym membership. Who would have thought years ago that you didn't have to commit to a year before you joined the gym? You could just come and go as you wanted. What's that a sign of? It's a sign of a culture that wants to do things without commitment. (laughs) All over the place, voluntary organizations are struggling with recruiting. Because our instinct is to seek personal comfort rather than personal commitment. So I want to end by showing you a great motivation from Jesus to help us to either get started in this sacrificial love for our brothers and sisters or to keep going if you're finding it hard, right? Listen to verse 17. Now that you know these things, and how do they know, the, how do they know these things? Because he just told them. You will be blessed if, notice the if, if you do them. So what a motivation. The word blessed here is a way of saying you'll be really happy. You'll be really joyful. (laughs) So sacrificial service for your brothers and sisters in the example of Jesus is not the way to dullness, drudgery, and a hard time life. It is the way to joy and happiness. And Jesus Christ says, but get this, you will not simply be happy if you have listened to a sermon and have heard these things, written some notes, and went away and done nothing. You'll be blessed if you do them. It's the way to happiness. It really is. So if you've started, keep going. So many people actively, sacrificially loving their brothers and sisters. And I know some of you are very, very tired. Keep going. Keep going. In the tiredness, there is joy. But if you have resisted getting committed, and maybe you like sitting on the fringes of the church family life, I want to encourage you to get started. Both for the good of the church, and also for your good as well. The death of Jesus is both comforting and challenging. What a comfort. It results in our complete cleansing. It also challenges us because it results in radical service. Let's pray. So, Father, we pray you would help us not simply to listen to these words, but to obey them, to put them into practice, and give us confidence, Father, as we do this, that this is the way to blessing, to happiness, to joy. Amen.